What's up everyone, back here for another video. So if this is your first time on the channel, hi, my name is Alex Temes. I've been day trading for over 10 and a half years and I've made over $8.7 million trading and will pop up my broker statements on the screen right now. So in today's video, I'm gonna talk about the morning routine that made me a millionaire in the stock market and hopefully will make you a millionaire one day too. So I'm gonna get started and be very, very detailed with everything. So to start, I am located on the Eastern time zone, which means I am working with market time. If you're on the West Coast or somewhere else, just understand that all of these are based on market time. I wake up at 5 a.m. every single morning. And what I do first is I grab my phone and I look at the overall markets. Are we gapping up or are we gapping down? And is there any type of news catalyst moving the markets? By looking at this, it gives me a better idea of what to expect in the morning, right? Are we in for a volatile morning? Are we in for a little bit of a choppier morning? Or are we in for who knows what? So being able to see if the market is gapping up or gapping down, if there's a news catalyst moving it, kind of gives the overall picture of how the market is gonna act that day. I get to my desk around 5.15 a.m. with a coffee in hand and ready to go. The next thing I do is I look at the top percentage gainers every single day. As a short bias trader, I am looking for the top gap ups because the higher they gap up, the more room they have to the downside to fill that gap. So what I'm looking for is stocks that are gapping up at least 30% or more, right? So I like to read the news on the top 10 to 15 gappers every single day. And there's certain things that I do not like to see that makes me wanna disqualify these stocks. For example, these stocks move based on hype. Small cap stocks are just hype vehicles. So the press releases of these small cap stocks are pretty much meant to hype up the stock, move the share price higher, so that they could hopefully dilute shareholders, raise money, insiders could sell, et cetera. For example, if company XYZ is partnering up with Nvidia, that means that this press release will probably be picked up by mainstream media and be pumped for a couple days. That is not something I'm looking for, right? I do not want to short a company that has a multi-billion dollar, even trillion dollar company in the press release. These small cap companies are smart. They put that there on purpose to get people excited about the stock. Or if a company is partnering up with Amazon, Walmart, whatever. If I ever see in the press release that a company is partnering up with a billionaire, a multi-billion dollar company or a trillion dollar company, I let it go because chances are it's gonna be hyped up too much. As a long bias trader, that is exactly what you're looking for, but I'm speaking in the short bias perspective. Next is if there's pharmaceutical news, are these pharmaceutical companies moving on a phase one trial, phase two trial, or phase three trial? I have a rule where I don't like to short phase two or phase three trials because that just brings on way too many institutional investors, but a phase one trial, is nothing really that significant. So if I see a phase one trial, it's a green light. Or what happens if some of these sketchy companies put out the same press release twice? This is called rehashing their press release. This happens more often than you think. And the reason why this happens is because these small cap junk companies have nothing new to report. So they go back and reuse a press release that they used three to four months ago that they think people are not gonna realize to re-pump up the stock, right? Control F and some keywords is a very easy way to tell if they're using the same press release as before. Now, what happens if there's no news and the stock is gapping up 30, 40, 50%? That is my favorite. I love that, right? Because there's no reason, there's no catalyst for the stock to be up. So then I separate these stocks into the categories. The stocks I'm gonna ignore that have billionaire, trillionaire companies in it and the stocks that make sense. Phase one trial, no news, rehash PR. Now that I have that list of companies that I'm more interested in, let me tell you what to do next. The next thing to do is to look at the company filings. Do they have any dilution? Do they need cash? Is this a scam company, right? So I look to see if they have any ATM offerings, which means an offering that they could sell right when the market opens. I look to see if they have warrants, which means they have to hit a certain price before they can start diluting. Or I look to see if they have low cash on hand and the ability to do an offering. Why is an offering so important for these small cap stocks? The entire reason why these small cap stocks are listed on the exchange is to raise money. They are early stage development companies that don't have cash. And the best way for them to raise cash is to dilute shareholders. Now, what do I mean by that? The stock market moves based on supply and demand. If there is low supply and high demand, price goes up. If there is high supply 
and low demand, price goes down. So a lot of these small cap companies, what they do to raise cash is they increase supply, they increase the amount of shares that they put into the market through dilution, and this causes the price to go down. So if I see a stock that needs cash, and I see that the press release is a rehash press release, chances are that they're trying to pump up the stock so that insiders could dump and hopefully they could dilute shareholders and raise money. So a tool that I use is called Dilution Tracker to see all these company filings and cash on hand. The problem is that a lot of people are now using Dilution Tracker, so that edge has kind of been dissipated slowly. Back before Dilution Tracker, I used to look at the filings myself. I used to learn these things all by myself, and that was an edge because not a lot of people knew that. Okay, now that I've seen the stocks that have warrants, ATMs, and that need cash on hand, now that's into a different basket, right? So now I've probably narrowed down the top 15 stocks, right, that were top percentage gappers, to the top 10 stocks that then I looked at the filings, and now I've narrowed that down to the top five stocks. By this time, it's about 7.30 or 8 a.m., right? So this whole process takes a couple hours for me. So now that I've narrowed it down to the top five stocks, the next thing I do is I go to finviz.com and see if there's institutional shareholders and what the float is of these companies. Generally for me, if a stock has institutional ownership of over 50%, I tend to ignore it on the short side because those institutional investors will come and support the stock. And if I see a short float of anything over 30%, I am no longer interested because if a stock has a high short float and good news comes out, those people that are short have to end up covering their position, which pushes the stock price up. So an often overlooked indicator is the short float of these stocks. Anything over 20 to 30%, stay away. Additionally, the next thing I look at is the overall float of the company. So if a stock has a low float of under 1 million shares, I do not trade it. I've been burned so many times on these low floats, nano floats, I do not trade it. If it's a Chinese stock, I do not trade Chinese stocks. I haven't traded Chinese stocks in forever. These are ignore, ignore, ignore. So what I like to see is I like to see institutional ownership under 20%. I like to see short flow under 20%. And I like to see the overall flow above five to 10 million. So now that I've narrowed down those five stocks to probably about two or three stocks, the next thing I do is I look at the daily chart. Does the daily chart have a pattern of gapping up and failing? Or does the daily chart have a pattern of multi-day moves, right? Based on this information, it'll be able to tell me if this stock has a history of gapping and failing, or if this stock has a history of multi-day runners. Oftentimes, what people don't understand is history tends to repeat itself in the stock market. So if these stocks have a history of gapping up and failing, chances are they're gonna continue to gap up and fail. If these stocks have a history of multi-day moves, chances are they're gonna continue to have multi-day moves. Now, a lot of people think that technical analysis, the study of charts is BS. Let me tell you why that's wrong. So the reason why that's wrong is because 90% of trading is algorithmic robotic trading. That means that 90% of market participants are robots. Now, what you have to understand is these robots have to be programmed on something. They program these robots on technical analysis, the study of charts. So by knowing the key support and resistance levels, you will know where these algos are placing their trades. So anyone that says technical analysis is BS doesn't know anything about trading. So what I like to do is I like to look at the chart. Past history tends to repeat itself. So if the stock has a history of multi-day runs, I ignore it. If a stock has a history of gapping up and failing, I'm interested in it, right? So now I've narrowed it down to probably one stock, maybe two stocks on the day that I'm interested in looking at. The next thing I do is I look at the pre-market action. What is the pre-market chart saying? Where's the support? Where's the resistance? What am I looking for? As a short bias trader, I'm looking for stocks that ran up pre-market that are slowly finding its way down. Have you ever heard the saying, the trend is your friend? Well, what I'm looking for is these stocks are gapping up to already pre-market be selling off. That way, if these stocks bounce, I'll be able to short a bounce and join the trend to the downside, right? So I draw my support and resistance lines based on the pre-market chart and based on the daily chart, right? And at this point, it's 9 a.m. and I start live trading. 
So every single morning, I live trade for MIC members on Zoom, on screen share every single day, no delay, nothing. I go through the watch list and I trade live every single day. So I trade live between 9.30 and 10.30 and I stop my trading at 10.30 a.m. every single day. Now you may be asking, but Alex, why should I stop my trading? Don't I make more money if I trade for longer aspects of the day, for longer periods of the day? The answer is no. Let me give you an example. So I don't really like to say that trading is like the casino, but in this example it is. The reason why is because I want you to understand when you're at the casino and you're gambling, do you make more money when you walk away from the tables or do you make more money when you sit there and keep gambling? Obviously the answer is when you walk away. So that's the same thing I do in my trading. At 10.30 a.m. I walk away every single day. And the reason why is because my mentor Bao and I, we used to make money every single day in the morning and we would lose it after 10.30 because we want to maximize our gains and we want to make more money. But what we realize is after 10.30, the volume shrinks, the algos take over, and these stocks end up bouncing. So as a short bias trader, your window of opportunity is between 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. every single day. After 10.30 a.m., that's what we call a zombie move because these dead stocks come back to life. That's where long bias traders start to have the edge. So if you're a long bias trader, 10.30 a.m. is your signal to make money. And that's where I stop my trading and that's where I walk away every single day. So that's the routine that I use every single day to make money trading. It's very detailed, it's very intricate, and it's the same routine that I use to make over $8.7 million trading. Now, some asterisks, some things to note, right? Is you could go through this entire routine and there might be no stocks that fit your criteria. Maybe all the stocks moving have billion dollar names in their press releases. Maybe all the stocks moving are Chinese or low float stocks. Maybe all the stocks are moving are highly capitalized stocks, right? What do you do then? At that point, you don't place a trade. So you could go through this entire process every single day and still not be able to find a trade because as traders, your job is to show up to the market and wait for your pattern and wait for your opportunity to be there. If your pattern is not there, if your opportunity is not there, you do not place a trade. There have been many times that I showed up and forced a trade when nothing else was there and I wish I could go back and just not trade for those days, right? I'm sure you guys have had days like that too where you're like, there's nothing moving, let me press a couple buttons and all of a sudden you're losing for the day. So to recap everything, wake up, check what the overall market is doing. Get to my desk, look at the top percentage gainers every single day, then read the news, narrow it down even more, look at the filings, narrow it down even more, look at the institutional ownership, the short float, the regular float, narrow it down more, look at the daily chart, narrow it down more, look at the pre-market chart, and then make a plan and trade it live, right? So you don't need to trade 10 to 15 different stocks every single day. I am very selective. I trade one to two stocks every single day and that got me here to where I am making this video for you guys. So if you guys enjoyed this video, leave a like, leave a comment. What does your morning routine look like? I'm also gonna include some live trading videos so you can watch me trade live and some links to some past videos. So thank you guys and let me know what you wanna see on the next video.